Well, hey, idiots, welcome back to Observe. In today's video, we're going to be analyzing the nonverbal communication of Casey Anthony. More on that in just a second. Let's go ahead and roll the intro. All right, so this is still yet another sequel to a multi-part series. If you would like to be able to get the context and everything that we have been going through for this series, please check out the other videos on the channel. Eventually, I will be making a playlist of the Casey Anthony series. So if you want to watch the whole thing all at once, you kind of can do that. Anyway, in today's video, we're going to be going through yet another episode of the docu-series released on Peacock. Let's go ahead and start right into the actual content. Casey take a moment and explain what it feels like to be at the center of that I, I don't I'm rarely at a loss for words this is this is one of those moments I can't describe to you how it feels except to say I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy I wouldn't wish this upon any of the people who were trying to kill me or any of the people who would be watching this and still thinking that I'm guilty I wouldn't gonna go ahead and pause here okay so to add some context as to what they're talking about here. The question is centered around being at the center of this hate storm that the public and some of law enforcement, etc., is sending towards Casey. So Casey is now saying, I would worse the, wish this on my worst enemy. Now, as she's starting to talk about the people that are wishing her not so well, you're starting to see a little bit of scorn, disgust, and anger enter across her face, scorn in the eyes with the narrowing there of the anger being the drawing together and lowering of the eyebrows, and then the disgust creeping in around the corners of the nose, which we're all very familiar with here on the channel. So we're seeing what Casey Anthony's actual feeling towards those people that are being not so kind to her is, and that's anger, scorn, and disgust. So that does make sense contextually, but if... If we know anything about Casey, it sounds like there's going to be an opportunity here presented for Casey to have a level of self-pity, which in the past when that has come up, Casey has definitely been able to open up emotionally when it's concerning her, not so much her daughter, daughter Kaylee, but we'll see how this actually plays out throughout this episode. I'm guilty. I wouldn't wish this upon anyone, ever. That's how bad it is. This is what hell feels like, is what I was put through for those three years. Let's return to jury. I'm gonna go ahead and pause. So we're seeing that that also switched off of their face, that expression of anger, frustration, not a lot of sadness that wasn't creeping out there, which I'm kind of impressed. Usually this would be an area that Casey would start crying for themselves, but they didn't hear. So in this area though, we're seeing that all of those more turbulent expressions play across her face. And then when it cuts to the angle of her flashing up at the rear view mirror, and she's looking off to the side, all of those wipe away and it's replaced by this substantial mouth shrug and uh, looking away, obviously, and shaking the head. No, now that doesn't convey a lot of certainty. So in this, what I'm being able to pick up is that she's obviously angry and likely towards the people that are angry at her, but whenever she looks away, we're seeing that there's a level of uncertainty. Maybe she's finding it unbelievable. That could be a reason for the mouth shrug, which mouth shrug is the same as a shoulder shrug, and I don't know, in this specific culture that we're working with here. So perhaps that's coming out there, or it could mean that she doesn't have any weight to her words herself, aka it could be a, a level of deceit here, possibly. Anyways, let's continue forward. Madam Clerk, you may publish the verdicts. As to the charge of first degree murder, we, the jury, find the defendant not guilty. I'm going to go ahead and pause and just make a note about her expression non verbally here. This is astutely blank and very attentive. There's no blinking, very strong and heavy eye contact. So once we hear the verdict, we'll be able to see what sort of emotional displays spread across her face from there. And we'll also be able to tell whether or not they're genuine or false, judging by the profile by which we're able to see them. So let's just see how that plays out. Jury, find the defendant not guilty. As to the charge. Okay, rapid increase in blinking. That means that there's a lot of psychological processing that's going on behind that. Anytime you see somebody go from a certain state of blinking to blinking a lot, usually indicates that they're thinking about something extra beyond that they were before and that would make sense especially if a load of emotions just washed over casey and we're seeing an actual 
genuine what seems to be authentic onslaught of an emotion it spreads across her face not as one solid crash like a wall or a sudden shift like we saw when she broke broke the aggressive aggression to look out the window earlier this one slides across her face and you see it across her eyebrows and then the lower half of her face including her eyes as well and that that pushes me to believe that that specific display of emotion was being genuine but let's go ahead and continue forward here there's some more verdicts that are about to be given as to the charge of aggravated child abuse may the jury find the defendant not guilty when that verdict was read we have this massive team embrace they saved my life after three years of dread and sadness finally it proved my innocence. Did you ever give Xanax? I'm gonna go ahead and pause that there. I, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, that's not exactly what they proved. I believe they just proved that she wasn't guilty or had it to where she was not able to be proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. I believe that that's the actual circumstances of the case, not that she was proven innocent. Now, along with that, we're able to see at this very last bit where it's obviously the camera is now focused back in. We're back in the documentary side of things. She says, prove my innocence and hold some really steady eye contact with the interviewer at that time. She wants to be able to check to make sure and she's registering to make sure that that specific line sunk in. So considering those two things, that feels like a low level of manipulation that obviously that wasn't the exact circumstances of the case. Despite that case, he wanted to see if that had sunk into what uh, she was hoping it would in regards to the interviewer, and it seems to have. Let's continue forward. Did you ever give Xanax? No. Kaylee. I never gave Kaylee anything other than cold medicine when she had a cold. That was some concocted bullshit story, whether by the media or someone affiliated. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and pause here. We're seeing a lot of anger and aggression here, and it starts a little early through the question. The question starts, and before the interviewer gets the full question out, Casey is already jumping in with the aggressive no, the outrage, the shaking of the head. All of this would be rather synchronized. What's interesting to me is one, that early start into the question kind of leads me to believe that she knew that question was going to be asked beforehand, which then also leads you to believe that all of these answers had been rehearsed, which obviously that's the case here. This has been many years since the actual case itself, so she's rehearsed all of these a fair bit. And so that emotional onslaught of that intense aggression feels like it might be a little bit forced in this circumstance. And that would make sense if she's really trying to get that thought out of everybody's head that she could have done something like that, trying to get that out of there. And she's also able to kind of qualify her pre-knowledge of this question by saying that was just a story that had been made up before. So obviously she's familiar with this question, which could also still explain how quickly she came into answering that without having any time to think about it or seemingly be caught off guard by it. But let's go ahead and keep watching. I'm trying to piece things together that don't fit into anything because they don't exist. None of that is real. I never saw Casey with Xanax. I never saw her give Case or Kaylee any Xanax, but just the fact that Zanny the nanny was said just send a light bulb off in my head. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and pause that there. Okay, so we're seeing outrage from Casey, very frustrated by this, this question, and whether or not that's fully genuine frustration is what we're kind of curious about. But then it pans over to this guy who knew Casey and Kaylee and the family, and his reasoning for it is that, well, no, nothing ever actually pointed to that. I just had the feeling that that would be the case because of Zanny the nanny being used, which was just a, a nickname for an actual nanny of the time. So this, this Zanny the nanny thing really had nothing to do with anything whatsoever. And what I'm finding interesting that the documentary did here is that they specifically found these instances where there was an accusation that had no weight behind it. It was a straw man. It's easy to disprove. And those are the ones that they included in this docuseries rather than any that were actually tangible. That lets you know that this docuseries is very, very much just weighted to clearing Casey's name. So anything that we're looking at is going to be the best version of it that we can get our hands on. This is going to be the best of the best or else they wouldn't put it into this docuseries because it's not then helping prove Casey's case. 
So that also lets us know that any of these areas where we're seeing, well, these are still red flags, that, that means that those are red flags that are seeping through hours of editing and production decision making before making it into this docu-series, which is solely centered around giving voice to Casey Anthony. So that's, that's important to make note of, that even with all of these things stacked up against it, you could still see some of the things slip through. Let's continue watching. Two of the people that I feel the worst for is Cindy and George. George and I exchanged a couple of emails. I couldn't even begin to understand what it, what it would be like to not only lose your grandchild, but to lose your child at the same time too. Yes, that would be that this this would genuinely be very extremely difficult to be in the parents' position. That's very valid. That doesn't really have anything else to do with the case. It felt like this was just added into the mix to show that there was a certain level of bias in this entire case's approach to Casey, which I don't necessarily buy at its full face value here in that this docuseries has shown that it's nothing but bias in this scenario. So with that in mind, then uh, we need to take that with a grain of salt, that this is how it all played out because they're, they're posing people and scenarios that obviously weren't going to hold much weight. So with that being said, it's interesting to see that the docuseries will really harp on this relationship of various people with the father and how the father kind of holds himself and composes himself around people. We'll talk about that in a second. Let's go ahead and keep watching. If Casey's even watching this someday, yeah, I blame my daughter for Kaylee not being here today. You blame her then and you blame her today? Yes, sir, I do. I, I do. You don't disagree about that? We do. What happened with my father was... I'm going to pause that there. And just the little clip that we're seeing of Casey watching her father, her father says, yes, yes, sir, I do. Very, very noticeable head nod in there of affirmation. But along with that, we're seeing a lot of difficulty in the eyes and mouth areas of holding any sort of consistency. Eyes, we're seeing a lot of blocking. Yes, sir, I do. A lot of eye blocking, long, prolonged blinks. And then we're seeing a lot of lip compressions in there. That's not the same as the shrug. These lip compressions are where the lips nearly disappear. This can be seen in areas where people feel like they're saying things that they shouldn't possible deceit. Now, in nonverbal communication, there are no universal tells of deceit. That's never been a thing. It will, as far as I'm aware, never be a thing. However, there are universal emotions that do play across people's faces, and there are some cultural emotions and displays that can fit into culture to culture. And that pushes me to believe that he might not necessarily believe what he's saying there, that he does fully blame Casey. This is adding extra muddiness to the case, but there's going to be more context added. Let's continue watching. Father was irreparable, and that's how I felt about my mom also. It's been the same pattern now for 11 years. My parents being in the public eye, Throw me under the bus for money. What do you think really happened? My gut feeling inside, I believe Kaylee was given something and she didn't wake up. Do you think she intentionally wanted to kill Kaylee? I don't think she intentionally wanted to. I don't, think, I don't think she intentionally wanted to, but she should be in jail because of Kaylee not being here. I want to think... This is just an interesting thing to hear a father speaking about their daughter, the, this ruthlessness. It does raise some red flags to me. There's obviously the philosophy behind that is if you are wanting to find out if somebody else is guilty in a party to cast judgment upon part of the party to see how the other people might react. If they react very in support of it, then they might actually be innocent. If they ask for leniency for said guilty party, then perhaps they are also Guilty. So there is that possibility that that's what's playing in here is that Mr. Anthony is just very gun ho for the punishment, but that in no way lines up with other areas where he says that he did not at all believe that Casey was involved in this. So now we're seeing this contradiction pop up and that contradiction then makes this area a little bit more of a red flag. So with this, I am now feeling more suspicion towards the father without actually feeling any less suspicion towards 
Casey. So far, it seems as though we're just gently unearthing that both Casey and the father are pretty terrible people. That just seems to be what we're doing, but let's continue on forward. It looks like Casey's having a really good time right now. I want to think he doesn't have the power to hurt me anymore, but he still does. And this was years ago. This interview. One of the many that he and my mother did separately and together for money. For money. Throw me under the- Okay, so we're entering into another area where KC has the ability to possibly feel a little bit sorry for themselves and we're seeing the tears come out. These, these all align. So far, just from what I'm noticing, just from watching this docuseries, I have not seen an area where Casey has cried unless it has been in regards to themselves. It's never been around her daughter. It's never been around anybody else, just themselves. Just something to make note of. Now, as far as the rest of the nonverbal communication, we're seeing a lot of the widening of the eyes and lowering down of the eyebrows. This is the absurd expression. People will make this expression whenever they find something to be unbelievable or absurd that will come out there. It's based in fear and anger and the, the combination of those two in regard to absurdity, something that shouldn't exist. So that's coming out there where she's talking about the parents using her for money. We're seeing a, a, a normal pattern come out from Casey here with a little bit of self-pity and uh, uh, some, some possible blame shifting being thrown in as well. Let's continue watching. Throw me under the bus for money. Why? Why exploit this situation any more than it has been? I lost everything the day I lost her. Everything. And it doesn't matter what I've done in between and the life I try to live and how good I try to be. And every day I live with a broken heart. I want to know why. I want to know why she was taken out of my arms. Why didn't he call 911? I wasn't the only one that was home. Okay, so we're seeing some more genuine emotion come out. Ironically, it is right in tow with the there's the possibility we might need to feel bad for Casey in this area, but some of the things that Casey is bringing up are quite valid, especially with this thing here at the end where she's saying, well, why didn't my grandfather or my father, Kaylee's grandfather, call as well? Why wasn't there more effort in general when this accident supposedly happened? And what we're running into the issue of is one that's blame shifting from Casey to anybody else, which we've seen Casey do again and again and again. But we're also running into the issue of we still do not know. Casey has not said. Nobody has said what actually happened that day. So we're left wondering why why this specific position was even posed in general. So Casey is not saying that she knows that her dad did anything to Kaylee. She's not saying that because she doesn't no, but she is trying to heavily, heavily imply it here, which is a small level of manipulation, which we're just keeping our eye out for. There's manipulation everywhere. So we're keeping our eye out on that. But we are seeing this genuine emotion come up. It is hand in hand with Casey's own uh, self-pity. But let's see where else it might be able to be directed. Why? And why, after all this time, keep blaming me for something I didn't do? Why? I'm gonna go ahead and pause that there. So there wraps up the the thought, the feeling of that specific segment of the interview with, again, Casey being like, "And why is this all happening to me? Why, why, why is that happening to you? Please feel some pity for me." Is what it summarizes as, and. What we do know about Casey is that she is admittedly a, a, a very versed liar. That she'll lie about anything and everything for whatever sake of it. And we're also seeing that she has a tendency to try to spin herself out of any narrative as being completely innocent in that narrative. She's the victim in this completely. There's no no responsibility of her own. And when when responsibility is admitted, it's done in such a way that it's to get your sympathy for them. It's done in a manipulation. This isn't building a strong character to be able to 
base ourselves off of for buying anything else that Casey is saying. But if you remember from the earlier episodes of this, Casey learned a lot of their way of functioning from their father, which will come up here and there. Let's continue watching. I know that hearing some of this is, is going to make them hurt too because they're going to feel my pain. <laughs> and that more than anything is the main reason I haven't talked about it. So this is a white knight move from Casey. She's saying that she's not talking about these things because it would make people feel the intense pain that she's already feeling. And she doesn't, that's the main reason is to spare other people, which could be the case. I don't necessarily buy that. Also considering the rest of the character uh, characteristics that we've been able to observe pattern wise from her in the past, this doesn't fit at all, at all with that. So that's not something that I would necessarily buy just based off of the pattern recognition alone. Now, non-verbally speaking, as she's speaking through there, there is a substantial amount of discomfort across her face in the form of sadness and grief, it seems to be, with the tears being the primary source of everything. And there are a few things to note about that. One, she's not making an enormous effort to try to wipe away the tears, but th this has been going on for a while. And if somebody continues to cry for a long time, it's also less likely over time that they'll continue to try to wipe away the tears because they're obviously just coming. So that could be the answer there. Could also be because she wants us to feel a little bit of pity for her, which she has done verbally and, and through her other actions, even in this docuseries. So there is that possibility as well. But with that primary emotion being there, any of the other ones are are pretty well masked or muddied by it. So we'll have to just be able to keep this this little area in mind as we continue forward. My father promised me that I could come home from this place. I'm remembering him coming and visiting me. I'm remembering him promising me that I would come home. I'm remembering him promised me that everything was going to be okay, that Kaylee was going to be okay. I'm remembering every fucking day that I spent here. I still need the same answers that I needed then. And I'm going to go ahead and pause. So we're hearing her, her pitch her tone and the force behind her words all kind of increase a bit. Also, the flow cadence has sped up as well. We're seeing the aggression come into the eyebrows and even just the general movements of the head. And we're also seeing the anger come into the eyes and lower half of the, the face as well, including the mouth. So we're seeing this all come across in relation to her father, which if we're to take Casey's side of things, then her father was not a very kind human being to begin with, but then we're still battling with that. Well, why wasn't any of this brought up before? It seems like it would be a really handy thing to have been brought up before, but we're seeing this come across. I would honestly feel like this emotional display is genuine from Casey. I think that she probably has a fair amount of distaste and anger towards her father. Why that is, is something that we have to continue picking away at, but I would say that that emotion does genuinely exist there. Let's continue. And I need to know why all of this happened in the first place and why he pinned it all on me. You know, I walked into your room last night and just looked around and had a couple extra little prayers and just said, you know, you're coming home soon, sweetheart. Kaylee's going to be home soon, so we can be that, that family again. He's telling me that I was coming home soon. It would all be over soon. I just had to keep following his instructions. Something that I want to make note of is that he's not making any effort to look up or acknowledge Casey on any level. Now, regardless of how this interaction is, it's obvious you can even see in the background that there are screens that can face other people. So maybe this is a video call, something along those lines. Or maybe there's even just a pane of glass. We, we can't see that side of the camera, but... He's able to look up and see Casey. Casey is obviously watching a screen or a person, but he's never once really looking up and, and acknowledging Casey on any level. That's interesting non-verbally speaking. And there's a few reasons why that could be, not the least of which is that this could be a very uncomfortable talk for him. Maybe he's not 
used to being in this sort of scenario. So he doesn't know how to act in this area. So the 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 lack of security, the insecurity is coming across in forms of guilt and or shame with this constant looking away and down. Regardless, it's not putting a lot of of confidence in his behavior during this area to see that sort of display consistently despite Casey obviously trying to make a connection. So at this point, I am seeing more red flags centered around the dad's overall behavior, but it is still not excusing Casey's behavior. It's just adding more. So let's keep watching. He told me what he thought I wanted to hear, that he was supporting me, that I was coming home, that everything would be okay. And on national television, acting like he was supporting me, coming to the jail prior to that prior to me ever being indicted. I don't believe my daughter could hurt anyone. Why do you think she was arrested and charged, George? Ah, uh, because they had their, like Cindy said, they had her mind made up. It was just too easy for them to just close the book on this and say, well, we're gonna charge you with uh, your daughter's disappearance and just be done with it. In this interview, my father's telling the truth of my innocence, that law enforcement went after me. Now, what I find interesting in this segment where the dad's telling the truth is that we're seeing the same pattern of extended breaking of contact with the eyes looking away and down which we just saw a little bit ago was an indicator of, of, of possible at least discomfort with the the conversation being had and it's it could be related to insecurity be that because it's partially false or because it's just uncomfortable thing a topic to speak of we're not sure but we're seeing that now pop up in this interview where casey is like no 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 this is definitely like my dad's just all the way telling the truth here. And it sounds and feels almost like Casey is just finding areas where they're able to just say, yeah, no, at this part, even though my dad, even though I myself said my dad lies all the time, this is a part where my dad isn't lying and I'm able to tell. And this is on another layer as we're listening to somebody who lies all the time say that they're not lying about somebody else who lies all the time not lying it's it's a mess but we're supposed to go along with it so let's do that but yet he testified in front of the grand jury almost two months before this i found out that my father had testified against me at the grand jury on october 14th the same day that the grand jury was convened besides law enforcement the only non-law enforcement affiliated individual to be called to testify was my father and he was their first witness. This is uh, gonna be very hard for me to do. My focus is always on my granddaughter, it always will be. Oof. So we're still seeing this from, from the father, a consistent and heavy breaking of eye contact in areas that are Odd. It's it's a fascinating area where he does this, and it's very substantial each time. The one that really catches my eye is that he says that his granddaughter and everything about that is of utmost importance, and then he heavily, heavily breaks eye contact, looks down, flashes this expression of guilt and or shame. So I don't necessarily buy that statement there. One, because it's an always statement and that's not the case. It's very rare that somebody can always be something or always do something. So in and of itself, logical fallacy. But with that, along with that, when we're seeing that display of shame afterwards, then the question is, why did that flash out so hard right after saying those things, unless there was something about it that proves it to be difficult? Something to keep our, our minds on. Let's continue. At that point, did you have any idea that your father was going to testify against you in that way? No. There were moments and instances. No, that was synchronized all the way throughout. There was a, a light flutter blink in there, which could mean extra processing. I have heard it tossed around on the internet in places that that fluttering blink can be an indicator of deception. I don't see any evidence actually of that it definitely does mean extra processing so in in certain contexts it can be an indicator towards deception but it's not it's not that so if you see somebody do that fluttering double blink sort of thing that's not meaning that they're making anything up or anything along those lines so i do see that coming out the rest of that seems to be fairly synchronized 
that's it's difficult to say whether or not she's telling the truth in this area but from what i'm seeing i would be more inclined to believe that she did not know that that was going to happen let's continue moments and instances that i knew something was off and i knew something was wrong and the promises that he was making he wasn't keeping but after the indictment i was able to listen to his interviews with law enforcement just before i was initially arrested my father talked to your investigators he talked to me at the car as I was at the end of the driveway. I noted in my report what he'd said. I'm going to go ahead and read this out for anybody who can't see the screen right now or isn't watching. What George, the father, said was, I was approached by, or no, this is what the police officer says about George saying. Anyway, I was approached by her father, George, who stressed his concern that his daughter is holding back information. And then it goes on to say, which you'll be able to hear this, that the dad more or less dumps on Casey saying that she's a liar. Now in this docuseries, Casey is saying, but I think that my dad's a liar. And so far, it seems as though both of them are telling the truth in this story. Um, this thing that each of them is a liar and it's only centered around how the other person can be less trustworthy than they are because... I might lie, but they're also, they're pretty big liars. And it feels that sort of vibe from George here. I'll talk a little bit about what we weren't able to see because it wasn't including Casey here in just a moment. Let's keep watching. Well, my, my daughter lives on the edge. You know that from all the lies, all the contradictions. My daughter takes things as far as she can take them. Everything that she's done, not only just recently, but going back months, doesn't have in my mind. How come she's supposed to be one place and then she's someplace else? Where's my grand? I, I want to know this stuff. We're looking at this like a 500 piece puzzle. We've got the outside edges done, but everything we need in the center, it's not there yet. It's so what George is doing here that's fascinating and manipulative is he's building rapport with the law enforcement using the verbiage and lingo that they would be used to. He is a, a, an ex-cop himself. So he is doing this and he's starting to clump it in with we phrases and us phrases, which makes it to where he's removing himself from the sus suspect cool in a very clever, manipulative way. This building of rapport, asking these sorts of questions, this is showing at very bare minimum that he has put a lot of thought into this case. And with the rest of the rapport building techniques that he's using, he's then roping in whatever law enforcement is with him to being like, yeah, see, I've thought a lot about this and I'm definitely on your side. And this is early, early on in the case. He's already thrown one of his family members under a bus very quickly in regards to this. And there has been some decent reasons for that. But this behavior in and of itself is, is alarming to me personally. To see somebody scrambling so, so, so hard at even the risk of throwing their relatives under the bus for something that has not yet been proven is a red flag to me. And so to see George doing this sort of thing is is something that I want to keep my eye on for out for the the rest of this docu series because this is behavior that is is difficult to quantify otherwise. So let's let's keep watching. It's a puzzle. There's just some pieces missing. We got to get these pieces. George is kind of leading this interview, and it's like you're the fucking missing piece, George. That was 22. I was okay, so I'm going to go ahead and pause there because the defense now brings up that very solid point that maybe George is the missing piece of this puzzle that's having a lot of difficulties being put together. There is that possibility. What I find difficult in and of that is that the approach from the defense is very, very much emotionally driven to where we also know that emotionally speaking, they are all very invested in Casey, especially this gentleman who had just said that. So this anger, this rage that's coming out there, it lets us at least know that there's a level of enmeshment between Casey and her defense emotionally, which is fair and valid. That would make sense, especially with how long they've been together. But as the observer, you might hope to see a little bit more detachment from that to where facts and information matter more than the emotional state given, but we're not seeing that. That being said, it is still something that's important to leave into the consideration of all of this because it helps us understand what the interpersonal dynamics were that led to even this documentary being made. Let's keep watching. 22, I was a scared kid. 
I'm not scared anymore. Now I'm angry. I've reverted from that scared place. To now, over the years, my anger just built. The same man who would immediately go... Anger just builds. So what's interesting for me during that time is that I'm not feeling the emotion of anger very strongly presented from Casey. There are areas of it, the lowering together of the eyebrows and drawing in, that that definitely can indicate it. There's occasional grimaces flashed as well that could be mixed in with anger and disgust. That, that makes sense in there. But much of what it is, is this wide-eyed looking around processing ex expression that doesn't quite line up with the I'm very angry. So it could be true that Casey is feeling angry now. She was not feeling angry while filming that specific segment. She was trying to talk about being angry and, and wrestle up the emotion during that time. So that's where that disconnect is being presented there. It is still, again, as this entire documentary has been, it's, it's a level of manipulation. But let's continue watching. We've only got a few more seconds and then we'll summarize at the end. Would immediately go and report to law enforcement after he met with me. But yet on national television acting like he was supporting me. So I, be I believe my daughter more than 100%. Manipulation after manipulation after manipulation. But somehow... He got cleared by law enforcement from day one. All right, then we're going to go ahead and stop it here. There is obviously a lot more to this case. If you would like me to be able to continue going through the docuseries, analyzing it as we do, then let me know in the comments below. Now, this very ending clip here, especially the audio that we're hearing from the dad being like, I believe in my daughter 100%. No, I would not at all believe him saying that on any level with that long extended pause big intake of air inside there that lets us know he's having a lot of difficulty even just getting to that and then he lands on the 100 this is forced nonverbal behavior all the way around and it's pinging a lot of alarm bells for many people watching and it's the de desynchronization that would be the cause for that so yeah, obviously we're seeing a father who lies a lot and a daughter who is willing to say, my dad lies a lot. And we're, we're aware that this same daughter is one who lies a lot. And the dad will say that she does, in fact, lie a lot. And so we're, we're stuck here right now, listening to two different people uh, lie loudly at each other. And we're supposed to somehow get on board with one half or another where it doesn't really sound like that's the case. And unfortunately, through all of this, we have still lost a human being. And so I'll let you, I, it, it's, it's very muddy and it's, it's frustrating to see two so very overtly deceitful people trying to manipulate the viewer, the people that they're around on every single level to where neither of them want to admit having any fault themselves, but they do both want to pin it fully on the other. And to me, that is suspicious uh, from both sides, that sort of behavior all the way around. If you did like this video, like I said, uh, hit the like button, hit subscribe if you want to see more, leave any of your comments or suggestions in the comment section below. I try to keep up with those as much as possible. If you do want to reach out to me, I have a number of different ways to do that. You can go through the socials, which I'm getting more active on there in general. So either myself or somebody from my team will be able to respond to you. Uh, I have a Patreon. I'm going to be putting more things on that Patreon to add more value to it. But if you just feel like doing a little extra supporty supporty of Observe, that is the way to go about it. That's linked in the description of this video. Hmm. I have some big announcements coming up here soon. Uh, obviously, you can see that some changes are happening around on the channel. There will be more. There are some big projects. And yeah, just stay tuned to be able to see all of those. I hope you're as excited as I am. 2023 should hopefully be a pretty, pretty good year. That's, that's just my hope right now. So we'll see what happens there. But, but without further ado, that's all that I've got for the day. My name is Logan and you have been oh so awesome as you always are. And I will see you in the next video. Cheers guys.